I'm uh, truly coming. Good. I'm truly delighted to um, be here this afternoon. I'm truly delighted this day has come because we have been working on the idea for this conference for nearly three years. And it's just been very rewarding to see it all come together. Thank you for everyone who's participated in today um, and has contributed. Um, this has really come together very, very nicely. So I am just uh, very pleased that uh, we can be here together. And we've had some excellent exchanges and the ideas developing through the day um, has been, the, the flow of ideas has been excellent. I'm John Borelli and I work in the office of the president and uh, I am equally delighted that I'm able to introduce Lewis Hyde to you this afternoon. We had our doubts yesterday afternoon about this time with a lot of weather here in Washington. And um, thank you to a persistence of a wonderful man that uh, we have his presence with us as our, in our concluding uh, session. Lewis Hyde is a poet, essayist, translator, and cultural critic with a particular interest in the public life of the imagination. His 1983 book, The Gift, illuminates and defends non-commercial portion of artistic practice. In The Gift, Professor Hyde discusses the concept of gift exchange, especially applied to art and built upon the practice in tribal cultures when offering a gift is necessary and when it must be received with gratitude, thereby gifting the giver, and then it is passed on. His book, Trickster Makes This World, 1998, uses a group of ancient myths to argue for the kind of disruptive intelligence all cultures need if they are to remain lively, flexible, and open to change. In Professor Hyde's most recent book, Common as Error, he returns to the gift economy question in a spirited defense of our cultural commons, that vast store of ideas, inventions, and works of art that we have inherited from the past and continue to enrich in the present. Robert Darnton, Harvard University librarian, described the book in the New York Times Sunday Book Review as an eloquent and erudite plea for protecting our cultural patrimony from appropriation by commercial interests. He is currently working on a primer for forgetting, an exploration of the situations in which forgetfulness is more useful than memory. A MacArthur Fellow and former director of the undergraduate creative writing at program at Harvard University, Professor Hyde teaches during the fall semesters at Kenyon College, where he is the Richard L. Thomas Professor of Creative Writing. During the rest of the year, he lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he is an associate of Harvard's Mahindra Humanities Center. Lloyd Schwartz, a, another poet and a commentator on NPR's Fresh Air and professor of English at the University of Massachusetts wrote, reading a book by Lewis Hyde is like turning and turning a many faceted prism in more directions than you thought possible. Professor Hyde. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. It's humbling to follow the last panel. I thought uh, the students were wonderfully well-spoken and had fabulous detailed stories to tell and to share. Um, so I'll see if I can do anything equal to their model. Uh, as John said, my latest work is about the commons and particularly about cultural commons. He gave my definition, which I'll just repeat. The cultural commons is all this stuff that we have inherited from the past, ideas, works of art, inventions. I'm wearing bifocals. Bifocals were invented by Benjamin Franklin. Um, or Benjamin Franklin wrote an autobiography. 
and his book now lies in the cultural commons. Anybody can use it. You do not need to get anybody's permission. So there is this vast, in a sense, unowned uh, inheritance that we all have uh, and continue to create. So that's what I have been thinking about and particularly how to protect it and how to make it thrive. Um, and my own point of entry has mostly to do, well, one point of entry has to do with arguments that people have been recently having over copyright um, because that's a place where uh, the tension around uh, cultural ownership is clearly focused and um, one can say many things about it. And, you know, copyright was an invention of the 18th century. Um, and even at that time, people used to say maybe there was no such thing as property in books. Um, or we have figured out ways to create property in books. Uh, I found a quotation, there were, there were fights in the um, 18th century between publishers in England who had exclusive rights to publish certain books and then publishers elsewhere, particularly in Scotland, who thought, you know, how can you forbid me to print a book? And my favorite quotation, this is a, a Scottish printer who's ticked off that he's not allowed to print such and such a book. And he says, if a writer were to keep his lucubrations to himself, then perhaps he may be said to have a property in his noddle. But once he prints those lucubrations, and once somebody else pays for them and reads the book, the person who buys has just the same property that the author had. And I'm fond of this because when I first read it, I did not know what a lucubration was. <laughs> <laughs> so I will now tell you. It's, it's based on an old verb, to lucubrate. And to lucubrate is to study by artificial light. <laughs> so if you're up all night with a candle, the, the harvest of your midnight meditations are your lucubrations. And um, in a way, what this publisher is saying is an old um, idea about ideas. And that is that they're hard to own in the traditional sense. Um, there's a famous definition of, of ownership from the British lawyer uh, Blackstone Ownership, he says, is that sole and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world to the total exclusion of the right of anyone else uh, in the universe. <laughs> it's the exclusion piece of this. Ownership is the right to exclude. This actually goes, you know, it's nicely rich. It sounds like a publisher's contract, but... Um, so that's one idea about uh, what it means to own something, that if I own something, I know I own it because I can exclude other people from it. But of course, uh, the Scottish publisher's point is that ideas are non-excludable by nature. That is, once you have announced your idea to the world, it's hard to keep people out of it, uh, or you have to invent methods. So the, the technical terms of this is, is that uh, these kinds of goods are non-excludable and also non-rivalrous. Uh, that is to say, um, if, if I share my idea with you, I don't lose it. Uh, whereas if I share my bicycle, uh, then I don't have my bicycle. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and this is very old uh, thought about what it is, to, about, uh, about human intelligence. And just to give you one, um, this is, oh, I forget the exact date, but this is, um, Medieval. This is William Langland, the Pierce Plowman. Um, he says, human intelligence is like water, air, and fire. It cannot be bought and sold. These four things the Father of Heaven made to be shared on earth in common. So, uh, in a way, um, to talk about cultural commons is an interesting case in any discussion of commons. You know, the commons, well, I'll give you my definition of a commons, <laughs> um, which others have, but a, 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 let's say that a, a commons is a social regime for the management of a collectively owned resource. A social regime for the management of a collectively owned resource. So in the Middle Ages, of course, um, the, the language for this comes out of uh, like farming communities or, or villages where uh, there would be pastures which would be owned by the community or there would be fields and streams or woodlands uh, where there were certain common rights. If you had the right of Pisker, 
piscatory, you could go fishing in the common stream, or the right of turbery is the right to cut turf out of the bog, or the right of um, pasturage is the right to put your cattle on the, on the fields. Um, so uh, commons traditionally were um, land or streams or forests or stuff like this. And um, to say that they are, that the commons is not actually the thing. The, the commons is the rules that govern how people use the thing. That's where the commons lies. It's not actually the field. It's actually the rules that people use to understand how they're going to use the field. And in a funny way, then, the commons has three different pieces to it. There is always some resource that you want to use. So that's one piece. And then there is this set of rules by which you and your uh, comrades have agreed uh, to um, exploit the resource or use the resource. And then there are the people. There are you and your comrades, the commoners. Um, and so these three things, in a way, together make up what is a commons. And, and cultural commons then make an interesting sort of boundary case because of the non-excludable, non-rivalrous business. Um, you know, famously, uh, people have said, well, there's, there's a tragedy in the commons, uh, meaning that in, in embodied commons, like a field uh, where you pasture cattle, um, the, there could be a problem where uh, people just keep putting more and more cattle on the field until the field actually is destroyed. Or if, you, or if you had a fishery off the coast of New England and you treat it as a commons without any rules, you could soon t uh, destroy all the cod in that fishery. So th this is the imagined tragedy of a commons in which uh, uh, embodied commons have carrying capacity. They can only carry so much um, use and they will collapse if, if the carrying capacity is exceeded. I'll touch on this again later, but, but the point is um, that problem, it doesn't exist with cultural commons. That is, you can read Shakespeare in every home in the world, and it, it doesn't collapse. <laughs> um, so uh, if we cannot maintain, protect, and allow to flourish the cultural commons, that raises certain questions about what we're doing. Um, now, of course, with this business about uh, publishing books and uh, this poor Scottish publisher, we have figured out ways to counterplot nature. We have figured out ways to make what are by n nature non-excludable and non-rivalrous. We figured out ways uh, to turn them into um, things that you can exclude people from. And uh, the two main um, protocols by which we do this are called copyright and patent. So we invent legal systems which change the nature, which are laid over the nature of these things. Um, and then the question, of course, would arise, why would you do this? <laughs> Why? And there are a series of answers of why. And I should say at the beginning that I actually think it's useful to have copyright and patent regimes. I am not an anti-copyright guy. I am a pro-copyright guy. But, um, but there's puzzles around how it gets used that need to be thought through. And one way I got actually involved in this is that uh, I'm also a pro-public domain guy. I'm also, I think there's a reason to have a lot of stuff that's not owned and is freely usable. Um, you know, I, some years ago, I had to buy some actual penicillin. It was like 42 cents or something. I mean, th you know, th things that have fallen into the public domain are really available in a way that uh, things that are still proprietary are not. Um, nonetheless, I got involved partly because it seemed to me that we were with the rise of the digital internet and uh, digital copying, um, we began to have a great debate over how to organize all this stuff because the old rules of the road didn't seem to apply anymore. They were hard to enforce. And on the one side, you had people saying, hot dog, the internet is here, let's just put up every song we've ever heard. And on the other side, you had the, entertain the content industry saying, <laughs> wait a minute, we, we have to earn a living here. And um, and, and my feeling has been that the, the content industry is overreached. Uh, uh, at least when I began this, I was, you know, <laughs> let's share the music. Um, I'll say more about this. But, but one thing that the content industries did was to went on, they went on a big, uh, you know, they went to the Congress and got a lot of laws passed. And they also went on a kind of propaganda uh, campaign <clears throat> to make sure that people uh, understood their side of the story. <clears throat> 
And in their side of the story said, you know, if you um, download music without permission, it's just like going into a shoe store and taking a pair of shoes and walking out. Now, this is not true because of the non-rivalrous, non-excludable thing. They are confusing two types of property here. And yet, that story had legs. That story is just something that everybody can quickly imagine. Well, of course you shouldn't steal a pair of shoes. And at the end of this story, and, um, they would always say, if you do this and do that, at the end of the story, they always ended up saying, after all, theft is theft. <laughs> at that point, you kind of have to nod your head and say, I mean, when you get to the tautology at the end of a narrative, you are now, a friend of mine says, a myth is a story you cannot get out of. And so the myth of this kind of proprietary ownership has us at the end kind of confined in the theft is theft um, narrative. And so my project was partly um, to go back and see, well, what, what other narratives are there? Why, why else might we enclose part of the commons. That's, by the way, you may know, the, the language of taking common fields and turning them into private preserves is called enclosure. It more or less happens in the 19th century in, in Europe. And, um, and part of the argument over cultural commons has been that we are witnessing a, a second enclosure, a, a period during which uh, a thing we thought could be held in common, all the stuff in the public domain, was being enclosed in ways that should be resisted. Let me just say uh, <clears throat> um, two other things, one other thing about the commons. Um, the, so the commons in traditional usage, uh, w the reason that commons, agricultural commons in Europe were never tragic, they lasted for thousands of years, is that they uh, were governed by custom, by norms. And just to give you a hint of this, um, you might have the right to cut, cut rushes on the common, but only between Christmas and the February 2nd. Or you might have the right to cut branches off of trees, but only up to a certain height, and only after the 10th of November. Or here, I'm gonna have to read you a slightly more. If you were a farmer, who held what are called rights of common appendant, you were constrained in the following ways. You must own land within the manor. You must actively cultivate your own land. Your rights to the common pasture on the Lord's waste arising out of your need to pasture your cattle in summer when you are cultivating. You may only pasture beasts needed in agriculture, oxen and horses to plow. You may only pasture your beasts during the growing season. When your land is under cultivation, you must not put more animals on the Lord's land in summer than your own land can feed in winter, and on and on and on. Um, you know, these are customs in common. I think that's the name of an E.P. Thompson book. Um, and the, the last one, the last custom that uh, I have become fond of is commons like this, not only were therefore constrained by local use rights, but also um, one of the customs was uh, to beat the bounds. So at least once a year, if there were village commons, people would walk the boundary of the commons looking for places where there had been encroachments upon the commons, and they would tear them down. So if some farmer had been letting his hedge grow like this, <laughs> or had built a sty, or somebody built a barn, or, uh, <clears throat> and these were convivial affairs. Uh, they'd happen around uh, Ascension Day. <clears throat> And there would be beer and cakes involved, and uh, weapons of mass of minor destruction, mm -hmm. and, and people would beat the bounds and walk around and tear down encroachments. I say this because part of the thing we might try to figure out is how to beat the bounds of the cultural commons. Um, and just to say something then about the enclosure of the cultural commons, in a way, this has been happening for centuries. When copyright was first introduced. Uh, this is 1710, the Statute of Anne in England. Um, the term was 14 years, renewable once if the author or proprietor was still alive. So that's a 28-year span. And um, 
One thing to say about the, the original copyright law, it was in a funny way a law meant to increase the commons because uh, before that law, the way that printing was handled in Europe, and particularly in England, um, it turns out the government is always interested in controlling the press. And <laughs> so as printing arose in England in particular, the crown <coughs> gave monopoly pr privileges to certain printers. So this printer is allowed to print the records of the Congress, and this printer is allowed to do the Book of Common Prayer and stuff. But as soon as you have a monopoly privilege given to you by the king, you're going to behave and um, not print anything that either insults the king or um, the church. And uh, so monopoly privilege, and, and, and these monopolies were essentially per perpetual. That is, there was no end to them. So that if, um, if somebody wanted to print, uh, who, who is it? John Locke gets involved in a debate about this because he wanted to print he wanted to get a cheap copy of Cicero, let's say. But the guy who had the monopoly privilege had a crummy copy and wouldn't let anybody else print it. So there, in a certain sense, once there's monopoly privileges and certain printers, you don't have a public domain. You have a controlled press. And one of the things that the Statute of Anne did by giving a limited term copyright was um, uh, to give an, an exclusive monopoly privilege, but with a, with a short term to certain printers, <clears throat> at the end of which, things ripened into the public domain. Things fell out of, out of anybody's control. And uh, so the, the, the limit on the term of the right uh, created a downstream cultural commons. Uh, the same was true, in fact, at the, in, uh, even before that, you had to actually ask for your copyright. You had to you know, raise your hand and pay a fee and register. And of course, a lot of people didn't care to do this because what they were writing wasn't going to make money or they didn't care. So a lot of stuff went into the public domain immediately. Um, so in an odd way, the, the short term of monopoly privilege given to printers was a way of engendering uh, a public domain. So in terms of enclosure, what's happened, of course, since 1710 is uh, all the parameters by which copyright operates have been greatly expanded. So the term now <coughs> is essentially eternal. Um, <clears throat> for a person like myself, it's my lifetime plus 70 years. For a corporation, it's 95 years. This was adjudicated all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, when they extended. This was in the middle 1990s. The U.S. Congress extended the term. They tacked 20 years onto the term of copyright retroactively. And the reason they did this was the, the mother load of um, uh, creations from the early days of cinema and sound recording were about to fall into the public domain. And, and the content industries that owned these things thought, why should we let that happen? And they you know, gave a dollar to each congressman, and they got a law passed that said, you don't have to let that happen. We're not only give you 20 more years, but retroactively. I mean, it's ironic, because supposedly the copyright grant is there to incentivize. I'm going to write more poems because I can make money. But, if you, but Robert Frost, when they extended his copyright, he hasn't done any work since. Um, <laughs> so the retroactive thing was nuts. But at any rate, um, this, this, this extension, in, uh, so, and, and that law, uh, Larry Lessig and some other people took it all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, which in the court, I was actually in the room when they said, I heard Sandra Day O'Connor say, Mr. Lessig, this seems to be a very stupid law, but we can't, it's up to the Congress to decide. So, um, But there was a friend of the court brief uh, filed on behalf of the plaintiffs uh, by a group of economists who said essentially if you, if you do their kind of calculations about the future value of money and the present value of money, the, the, once you get up to like 95 years, um, the incentive to create is indistinguishable from the incentive of a perpetual copyright. All right, so all I'm saying is copyright has expanded in many ways and all of these expansions are a, a kind of taking from the public domain. Even, just to say one more detail about this, um, it, it's the limit on the term that's the important part of how copyright works. And it's supposedly an old bargain between the public and the private uh, inventor or creator that we will give you a short-term monopoly privilege, but the, but the limited term means it goes to the public eventually. And that's always been the understanding of why um, we do this. And um, 
uh, Jack Valenti, the famous uh, guy who worked for the motion picture industry, <laughs> said, well, okay, the Constitution says there has to be a limit, and uh, I, we think the limit should be eternity minus one day. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the people you're dealing with. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, <clears throat> so why might you uh, give the monopoly privilege ev even if it's a short term? And um, of course, the, the answer that I, I ascribe to and, uh, and the people who wrote these laws ascribe to is it's there to incentivize creation. That you need to, that, or one of the things it does, certainly, is to, um, give people uh, an incentive to come up with bright ideas to patent and to, and to write books that they're going to get royalties on. Um, I should say a second thing about this, that though actually, particularly in the patent area, this stuff emerges around the time when trade secrecy is declining and being replaced by public knowledge. The, the old, uh, old protocol was if you... Um, had a trade, <clears throat> like if you were an instrument maker, lens grinders in London, um, you knew how to do certain things which you didn't tell other people about because that's where your money lay. And um, uh, so knowledge would be uh, held in guild secrecy for centuries. And one other uh, reason to give the limited monopoly privilege is it releases things to the public. Um, and there's a case I talk about in my book. I mentioned lens grinders because that's what the case is about. Um, <laughs> I'll just tell you this quickly because it's an amusing story. There were, um, there, there's a problem with making a telescope lens, which is you get a little thing called color flare due to the index of refraction of the glass. And uh, a guy named Chester Moore Hall figured out that you could make a uh, cancel this out by making a lens with two different kinds of glass that canceled the index of refraction out. Uh, and so he thought, this is a bright idea. And he, he asked two different lens makers in London to make these lenses. You make this one and you make this one. Now, these guys were both too busy to do it. And they subcontracted it to a third guy. <laughs> and he sat there making these two lenses and said, this is weird. These two lenses fit together perfectly, huh? <laughs> And he said, and look at that, they color, they, they get rid of the color flare problem. Um, so the, fr from then on, the, the lens grinders in, in England knew how to make an achromatic telescope lens. Um, okay, you go forward 20 or 30 years and another guy named Dolland invents it again. And he applies for a patent. And part of the protocol of a patent is you have to describe what you're doing well enough that somebody else could do the same thing. You get the exclusive right for the term of the patent, but others then get to use it. So then this went to court, because of course the, the instrument makers, they thought, well, you can't have a patent. We all know how to do this. And it went all the way up to the high court. And, um, and it was adjudicated that the Dolan's patent held. And it was because uh, the patent goes to the person who releases it to the public, not to the person who keeps it secret. You know, the prior invention is not the issue. The issue is um, uh, public knowledge. And um, so, uh, in terms of why you might counterplot nature and make something excludable that is by nature not excludable, one answer is uh, to incentivize production, to give people a stream of income, to release things to the public. Um, but I began to think there are other answers. And so the project of my book actually was to go back to the founding generation in the United States, to Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and James Madison and, and um, and others, and, and th try to understand what they were thinking about when they first uh, put, put the language about um, uh, copyright and patent into the co Constitution, and um, wrote the first copyright law, which is 1790. <clears throat> How did they, were they in the theft is theft model or, or some other? So, um, and what you find if you read this material <laughs> is that, um, First of all, the, the, the two things that are sort of potentially in conflict here, they knew very well. There are a lot of talk about how uh, ideas should be common as air, and uh, Jefferson particularly talks about this, that they, they understood the non-excludability business, and they saw it, saw it as a value. 
And they also uh, understood the incentive argument and that there was a reason to give the limited privilege. Um, but finally, they were very much aware of the, of the problem of monopoly. Um, so the copyright grant is a, is, is a monopoly privilege. That's the way it should be described. It's not a property right, unless it's a very particular kind of property called monopoly. And because they were coming out of the, of the British experience, they knew that monopoly was a way to control the press and to, crawl, to control discourse. And that was why they were wary of um, uh, any kind of, in fact, Jefferson himself, when the Constitution was being written, this is 1780s, Jefferson is in Paris, and he's corresponding with Madison. And in the early letters, he says, I think there should be in the Bill of Rights an absolute for, uh, prohibition on all monopolies. Um, and he's thinking particularly about copyright and patent and for, uh, for the reasons I'm outlining. Um, so, so, so they associate a lack of monopoly privilege with freedom of discourse and Republican government. I mean, they were trying to do something that had not been done before. They were trying to set up uh, a nation of people who would talk to one another and, and, and deliberate publicly. Um, and th that they felt that um, any attempt to um, control discourse was a threat to this, um, to this project. Um, so in, in a certain sense, you could tell this story, and instead of at the end of it, you could say, after all, theft is theft. You could say, after all, democracy is democracy. And in a democracy, you want very low barriers to the circulation of knowledge. Um, and uh, <coughs> <coughs> the other place you find this argued is uh, John Adams' first um, political essay was an, an attack on the Stamp Act. And when I was brought up, everybody told me the Stamp Act was a bad thing because it was taxation without representation, which it was. But that never comes up in John Adams' essay. Uh, his essay is entirely about the control of the press, that the Stamp Act actually asked people to pay a fee on every piece of paper. And the fees were higher than they were in England, where they're also trying to control the press. Um, and, and so Adams' point um, is the democratic point that um, if you want to have a democracy, you need very low barriers to the circulation of knowledge. And, um, and it's a plot of tyranny to try to come in and have you put stamps on your pieces of paper. Um, so let me say one thing here. There's a distinction that I found useful in writing this book between uh, civic republicanism and commercial republicanism. And... Um, what we mostly know is the is the commercial republic. Um, actually, you know, some of this I get from from Michael Sandel. Um, the commercial republic values above all private individuals seeking their own self-interest. It assumes that property exists for the benefit of its owner, that owners gain virtue or respect from one another's eyes by increasing their property. Um, in the commercial republic, government has a very limited role. It leaves citizens to follow their own sense of the good. It's negative liberty, a lack of coercion. Social well-being and the common good are imagined to arise from the summed activity of private individuals seeking their private ends. So we're all familiar with this republic. <laughs> the, the civic republic, <clears throat> Here, autonomous individuals and private property are also valued, but property is assumed to exist in order to free the individual for public service. Liberty is positive liberty, citizenship being directed toward acknowledged public ends, above all toward creating and maintaining the many things that must be in place before there can be true self-governance, like a free press or literacy or public deliberation. Social well-being in this view cannot arise simply by aggregating individual choices. Private interest and public good are too often at odds. Citizens acquire virtue in the civic republic, not by productivity, but by willingly allowing self-interest to bow to the public good, or by recognizing that the two can be one. Civic virtue is not something that is born with you. It is acquired through civic action. So civic virtue 
was something you, were try you wanted to try to get, but you had to get it by becoming a public actor. Um, I mean, the, I do this partly in the book because I'm interested in, I call it the Republican two-step, that in this model of Republican governance, there is an emphasis on individualism and on private property. Uh, that, uh, but then the question arises, why do you have these things? Why do you have your own freehold estate? And why are you an independent citizen uh, in control of your own uh, weapons and in control of your own farm and so forth? Why? And in this civic republic model, it's because then you can become a public actor. And this is the base from which um, y you can proceed. Um, I mean, imagine if our current president had simply said, I am going to liquidate all my assets, put them in a blind trust, because I am now here to serve the greater good. All right. Um, <laughs> so the first, so in a way, my, my project in this book has been uh, framing, uh, in the George Lakoff sense, that, that the entertainment industry, industry has a story that frames uh, cultural properties in a certain way. It's the theft frame. Um, I'm then offering one, this is another, the democracy frame challenges that. Um, <clears throat> then I do a little bit with Benjamin Franklin in another way. I call F Franklin our founding pirate. <laughs> and I mean this in several ways. I mean, um, First of all, you know, famously in his autobiography, he explains that he was an apprentice to his brother in Boston, and his brother was kind of mean, and finally he just leaves. Um, and I asked my students when we read this, I said, is that, is that okay for him to just run away? And of course, they're Americans, so yes, it's wonderful. He should run away to Philadelphia. But he was breaking the law. He had a contract, an indentureship contract. Uh, he was supposed to work for his brother, and the point of the law was uh, he's learning a trade, and the trade, you know, the master to the apprentice passes the trade, you know, it's a special relationship. So this is a criminal. <laughs> the flight to Philadelphia is a, an initial act of piracy. Um, and of course he's a printer, and part of this business of the shift from trade secrecy to public knowledge is, uh, it, it's, it's augmented entirely by printing. The, <clears throat> that we begin to get books which are called books of secrets or books of mysteries, uh, which explain the trade secrets of, of, of different professions. And Franklin is much involved, not necessarily printing that kind of book, but he is, um, his, his profession is to be in, um, an agent in the public sphere. <coughs> and finally, the, um, in terms of piracy, one of the other things that was happening in the um, 18th century is that uh, as industrialism rose in Europe, <coughs> nations were jealous about um, their um, national um, technical knowledge. And so there were anti-immigration laws um, in which, because they didn't want skilled workers to leave the country uh, either with the machines they were using or with the knowledge skill that was in their hands and hearts. And um, uh, there's some wonderful moments in which Franklin gets involved in this. And Franklin basically is, uh, you know, let, <laughs> he says, anti-immigration laws are tyrannical. Such laws make a prison of England. They confine men for no other crime than being useful and industrious. <coughs> you should know, by the way, that um, the United States, in terms of intellectual property, the United States was a pirate nation for 100 years. Um, <laughs> because uh, th this is, the general case is that uh, culturally rich nations, such as ours now is, or we have a lot of know-how, I know we have a great culture, but um, uh, like high barriers to international, you know, like everybody to play by their rules. But if you're a culturally poor nation, you like to to steal stuff. And so in the 19th century, the United States um, was happy to uh, take books from England and print them. And in fact, the first copyright law in the United States, 1790, has in it a piracy clause. It says this law applies only to citizens of the United States. Anything else is up for grabs. Um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> 
And then Franklin also, one of the things that's remarkable about him is, is his, uh, how widely read he was, uh, how much of a collaborator he was, um, and um, uh, there's, a, there's a bizarre passage in Emerson, in Self-Reliance, uh, you know, this is the famous plea for individual consciousness. And at one point, he, he, try, he puts Franklin into this mold. He says, who could be the teacher for Benjamin Franklin? He was a unique. Well, this is a completely nutty statement if you know anything about how Franklin worked. He, he had many teachers. I mean, he taught himself to read by reading, or to write by reading these journals out of, uh, out of England. When he, when he made, he invented a wood stove. Um, that had particular properties, but the, the way he did it was uh, he, he read six books from Europe about how, to, how wood stoves worked, and he was working also with uh, Newton and Boyle's ideas about how uh, currents of hot air move. Um, even the <clears throat> his work on electricity was collaborative. He was one of four different guys in Philadelphia who who worked on trying to figure out a theory of how electricity works, and, and when he came up with ideas, he sent them to friends in England and they published them and they were spread around the world. So, and he, his letters always say, you are at liberty to communicate this. Uh, he never took a patent, he always said he's indebted to the past and is happy to be doing things for the future. So, I mean, happily he, by that time, didn't need money himself, but <laughs> um, uh, point being, I'm now finally suggesting a second frame within which you could have this discussion of why get involved in controlling this otherwise non-excludable, non-rivalrous material called art and ideas. And in this case, uh, Franklin and others at the time of the founding of this nation thought that the cultural commons should be largely open because uh, that's how creative communities work that for a creative community to work, you need low barriers to the circulation of knowledge. And the more you patent your stuff and copyright your stuff, the, the less discourse you'll have. So um, it's not just about democracy, it's about, um, for, in, in this age, it was about emerging science and trying to have a system whereby scientific conversation could go on. And um, again, the commons was the preferred model. And then finally, um, behind all this lies a, a model of what a human being is. Because the ways in which we manage property are also the ways in which we imagine ourselves. That our property protocols enable or disable certain ways of being human. And um, there's a wonderful remark of um, the German playwright Goethe. Uh, late in life, somebody's asking him to, about himself, how he thinks of himself. He says, everything I have seen, heard, and observed, I have collected and exploited. My works have been nourished by countless different individuals, by innocent and wise ones, people of intelligence and dunces. Childhood, maturity, and old age have all brought me their thoughts. My work is the work of a collective being that bears the name of Goethe. And you, the same is true of Franklin. Franklin's work is the work of a collective being that bears the name of Franklin. Uh, anything you look at in his, <clears throat> in his work, I mean, Franklin was a proud man and, and, and took plenty of credit, but he, um, he's, also, he's always amused by his own pride and, um, and knows that he also has debts. I wanted to read you a second quote that gets folded in here. <clears throat> because in the background of this lies the problem of um, of making, again, if, if by property we mean the right to exclude and, and therefore also the right to put a price on something and sell it or not sell it, um, this remark from Immanuel Kant has kind of haunted me. Kant says, in the kingdom of ends, everything has a price or a dignity. Whatever has a price can be replaced by something else as its equivalent. On the other hand, whatever is above all price and therefore admits of no equivalent has a dignity. And I, I say this, or I use this because um, I wanted then to talk about how the self, how we are imagined 
by way of these protocols by which we handle our property. <clears throat> and um, do we imagine ourselves as individuals or as collective beings? Um, there's actually in anthropology recently, there's been an interest in the word individual. It's an old world. You know, individual means that you can't divide it up. And individual means something that is made of parts. And um, apparently anthropologists go into villages and strange places and say, we're, we're here to interview some individuals. And they say, well, we don't, uh, we have never heard of that. <laughs> and and, and the, div the individual person is the person who knows who he or she is by relationships to others. That I am who I am because of my family and because of my gods and because of nature and because of the animals I live with. That's, that's what makes me, I am individual in that sense. And if you were to take those away, I am no longer who I am. Uh, I, I lose myself if I lose those things. So, um, uh, <laughs> in a way, then this comes down, well, I, I'll tell just a little story that illustrates some of the tensions in this. Um, in the 19th century, uh, in this country, there was a thing called the Dawes Severalty Act, D-A-W-E-S, Dawes Severalty Act. What was going on was Native Americans in the Western uh, states owned their land in common. And uh, good, do good liberals in the Eastern states thought, you know, that's the problem. Common ownership of land removes the incentive to better yourself, that people better themselves because they're selfish. And if you give somebody uh, an individual house, uh, they will try to repair it. But if everybody owns uh, the stuff in common, nobody will do anything. So, you know, this is one fable that gets told. And uh, so what happened, the Dawes Sovereignty Act, what it did was to take uh, Native American common land and uh, alienate it and to break it into individual plots, uh, giving plots to individual Indians, who, by the way, if they agreed to do this, became citizens and could even become policemen. Uh, uh, so what this, but what this does is to make the form of land tenure uh, individualist land tenure. So now you're mapping a certain kind of uh, image of what it is to be a human onto, onto your property rules. Um, I mean, in the background, what was also going on was they were taking land away from the Native Americans, giving it to the oil and railroad industries. But um, for me, the point is that, that um, it's, it's, it's a simple example of, in a way, a legal and property regime which makes it impossible to be the collective being that you thought you were under this other individual and property regime. Um, or let me quickly, what, what I do in the book is then to, to jump to, to the modern case and to say, is there such a thing as a collective being still? And, and, um, uh, and how do we help people be such beings? And I begin with a guy named John Solston, who was part of the team that decoded the human ge uh, genome. And Solston has a wonderful book called The Common Thread. Um, and he makes the simple argument, which many of you must know or you will have heard of, that, that actually scientific discourse uh, is, is enabled by uh, people being able to co converse without proprietary information, without, without sealing up the stuff. I should have some hint about when we should turn this over for questions, because I can go on forever. But um, who would like to hint me? Five. How's that? Five is more than enough. I'll just, I'll just say a couple more things. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, the, um, the three people I do are, are John Sulston, and it's an example of scientific community in which the community needs rules about how they handle their information such that it enables conversation. I also talk at some length about Bob Dylan when he was young and his immersion in traditional folk music and uh, how the ground, how greatly the ground has changed uh, since the entertainment industry got so interested in controlling music. 
Um, but the final example I give is um, the story of what's happened to Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream. And I won't go into it in great detail, but uh, after King died, his estate, mostly run by his son, Dexter, Scott, Dexter King, um, has taken, has, well, King himself copyrighted that, that speech, but everything he made went either to the movement or um, to, his, uh, all, to his college. Uh, but, but the King family has commercialized King's estate uh, to an astounding degree. Um, they wanted, when they did Eyes on the Prize, uh, they wanted $100,000 for a clip from that speech. When USA Today tried to publish the speech, they sued them for copyright infringement. Um, when a black fraternity wanted to put up a uh, statue of Martin Luther King, they forbade it because they control his image. Um, and uh, it's on and on. And in a way, what's, what's happened is... Um, I sort of come out of this out of Michael Walzer's uh, spheres of justice, that there are different spheres of, of public life. You know, there's the church life and there's commercial life and there's college life and there's the military and there's the marketplace and so forth. And um, uh, one idea of tyranny is that it is when you find one of these spheres beginning to take over all the others. So in a military dictatorship, the military runs all the spheres of public. Or in a theocracy, the church runs all these. It, at some level, it's important to keep them separated. And in the Martin Luther King case, what, what, what his children have done is to turn him from a public being, a collective public spiritual political being, into a chattel. I mean, they have made his legacy into a commercial entity. Um, and um, so I wanted to end on a slightly more encouraging note. Um, <laughs> what is to be done? Um, so uh, there's sort of two categories of things that we might think of as ways to beat the bounds or to uh, protect the cultural commons. One is to try to do it through the law. And um, in, a, in a sense, taking the uh, copyright term extension to the Supreme Court saying, look, the Constitution says there has to be a limit on the term of copyright. And this law essentially erases all limits. It's unconstitutional. That's an attempt to use the law of the Constitution to, <coughs> to constrain this. It failed, but, but others have come up with cunning, other cunning ways. I'll just mention two, and I won't elaborate on them, but a thing called the general public license that people in the software community use. What they do is they take a copyright on something they've invented, and then they release it to the public under certain rules such that downstream it's always going to be released. It's called, I call it catch and release. <laughs> they, they own it so they have some power in the, in the law, but then they also release it such that people can use it freely. The same has happened with this thing called Creative Commons. It's a series of licenses by which you can uh, release stuff to the world and, and say, look, I'm not interested in all the things that copyright gives me. I'd like, to, I'd like attribution. If you're gonna make money, I'd like some money, but if you don't make money, you can use it anyway. Um, Creative Commons licenses are a smart way to use the law to, um, to engender the commons. But finally, um, uh, there are places where this is done normatively, where people just agree, let's behave in this way. <clears throat> and I'll give one example, which is, um, actually this comes from John Sulston. Um, the people who work on the human genome need to be able to, or all genetic knowledge, need to be able to converse with each other swiftly and <laughs> and many of them are against uh, the commercial use of this material. So they had a meeting once long ago in Bermuda where they came up with a set of protocols uh, about what to do with emerging knowledge about the genome. And the, the basic one is the following. <coughs> when any research center gets, uh, describes something, genetic information at a certain level, they have all agreed to post it on the World Wide Web within 24 hours. And, um, and then there are computer systems internationally which aggregate and, and uh, spread this information. So that the fact is that every morning, all the research centers in the world are working from the same data set. Um, this is entirely voluntary. It's, it, it, it's a normative rule about how to behave if you're trying to do that kind of science. So there are ways to beat the bounds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So our first respondent this afternoon um, in, this, um, uh, in this panel that's looking at the question of how uh, culture shapes economy uh, is Fred Bonson, who is the director of the Food, Health, and Ecological Wellbeing Program and professor of the practice of ecological well-being at Wake Forest University School of Divinity. His research and teaching focus on the intersection of ecology, agriculture, and contemplative spirituality. In his co-authored book, Making Peace with the Land, he explored how the scriptural vision of Christ's reconciliation is not limited to people, but rather is cosmic in scope, which leads to practical implications for agriculture and ecological restoration. His book, Soil and Sacrament, tells the story of the church-supported community garden he co-founded in 2005, as well as describes his more recent pilgrimage among four agrarian faith communities, Trappist, Protestant, Jewish, and Pentecostal. Part spiritual autobiography, part narrative journalism, Soil and Sacrament was described by Kirkus in its starred review as a profound moving treatise on finding God in gardening. <laughs> His essays have appeared in Harper's, <clears throat> Oxford American, Image, Orion, The Sun, Christian Century, and Best American Spiritual Writing of Houghton Mifflin. He continues to explore the use of literary nonfiction as a distinct theological genre and is currently at work on a book that will articulate a contemplative response to climate change. Fred. Thank you. I'm going to use the podium here. Thank you, John, and uh, <clears throat> thank you, Paul. Uh, it's good to be with you all, and uh, especially with my uh, distinguished speakers here, Bishop Ty and uh, Lewis Hyde. Uh, it's good to be with you all. I'm going to go in a bit of a different direction here, but I think, I hope it's going to tie back in with. Uh, with some of what Lewis Hyde's been talking about and what we've been discussing throughout the day. This is sort of an essayistic response. So I want to begin by taking you outside to the forest. One afternoon in June, my three sons and I hike up Daniels Creek. We boulder hop our way upstream, stopping here and there to look for crawdads or dunk in a plunge pool. We hike several miles, much of that in the stream itself, wading shin deep through bracingly cold mountain water. We live just down the road from Pisgah National Forest. We've come here to look for eastern hemlocks. More specifically, we're looking for reishi, a medicinal mushroom that often grows on dead hemlocks. Hemlock trees are abundant in western North Carolina, and most of them are dying. Insect pressure, drought, a warming climate. The trees are stressed, mortality rates are high, which is a boon for reishi. Harvesting reishi mushrooms every June is one of many things my sons and I do in Pisgah. This national forest covers half of our county. People come here to hike, swim, camp, fish, hunt. Some come here just to sit beside the river, toes in water, beer in hand, and watch their lives float by. For those of us who live near Pisgah, the commons are not an abstraction. They are home. We round a bend in the creek, and my oldest son gives a shout. He points to the far bank, and suddenly we see them, a red cluster of reishi, barnacled on a mother tree's underbelly. One by one, we pry loose the smooth-skinned polypores from their host. We inhale the dank umami scent of fungi. As we wade back across the stream, a shaft of sunlight reveals millions of reishi spores swirling in the warm afternoon. We walk in the creek and talk about names. Ganoderma tsuge in Latin, Ling Chi in Chinese, reishi in Japanese. Because of its healing properties, reishi is known as the mushroom of immortality 
Our harvesting outings, I tell my sons, are like a free trip to the pharmacy. I explain to them how mushrooms, how the mushroom is the fruiting body of the mycelium, which feeds on the dead hemlock wood. Plucking the fruit does not destroy the mycelium, quite the opposite. When we bring the mushrooms home to cut and dry and store for winter, some of their spores will be released to colonize other hemlocks. As Lewis Hyde reminds us, the gift is preserved, not destroyed, in the act of giving. What we harvest here on Daniel's Creek is more than just mushrooms. By immersing my sons in this web of relationships between reishi, hemlock, water, and sunlight, I hope that the same imprint of love left on my heart by this place will be left on theirs. I want them to hear the deep bass note of, jo of divine joy humming just beneath the surface. We don't speak of these things. They are sacraments of the world's self-giving. Our role is simply to partake. Lewis Hyde writes in his book, Common as Air, the commons is sometimes the name of a primordial state or of the longing for its return. There are psychological, spiritual, and mythic elements to the commons. As we imagine this new economy, I want to speak in defense of that primordial state. For those ecosystems like Daniel's Creek, on which our lives depend. There are spiritual and mythic elements to the commons, and our lives depend on those, too. I should say that rather than engaging Hyde's work directly, I'm going to harvest a few linguistic reishi from his books to place in my foraging bag. Hyde primarily addresses the cultural commons. I want to speak about the connection between the cultural commons and the ecological commons. At some level, this little vignette of a foraging expedition with my children might seem hopelessly quaint, perhaps even a bit new agey. Medicinal mushrooms? Doesn't that fall in the same category as earwax candles and energy work, the kind of pseudoscience favored by people who wear lots of scarves and sport bumper stickers that read, my karma ran over your dogma? <laughs> but when you consider that three quarters of all new medicines in the past 25 years have come from nature, that 70% of cancer drugs are derived from forests, that because of its antioxidants and immuno-boosting polysaccharides, reishi mushrooms were officially recognized by the Japanese government a few years ago as a treatment for cancer. And when you consider that my sons and I, being American males, have a one in two chance of getting cancer in our lifetime, our little trip to the forest is not as insignificant as it might seem. The health of our bodies and collectively the health of our cultural and economic lives are utterly dependent on the health of the ecological commons. That should be a truism, but we're most, we mostly live as if it weren't. In the Jewish and Christian traditions, we're quick to point out that we were created imago dei, in the image of God. But we neglect that part of the story that says we were also created from soil. Adam from Adama, human from humus, as the Genesis account tells us, we are soil people. In Augustine's memorable phrase, we are terra animata, animated earth. And at this point in our history, it's especially important that we remember our earthbound selves. The world my sons will inherit, in fact, the world we're already living in, is the world of the Anthropocene, the era in which humans are changing the geological and biological foundations of all life. We passed 400 parts per million in the atmosphere of CO2. The Larsen Sea ice shelf in Antarctica will calve off any day. But I don't need to wheel out the long list here. You know it by now. And so I'll let the dying eastern hemlock serve as a synecdoche for climate change, which is global in scope, but stunningly local in the way it manifests. My first point is that as we imagine a new economy, we need to cultivate ecological imaginations. We must learn to see ourselves as immersed in and at every breath dependent upon places like Daniel's Creek, rather than see our human projects as somehow autonomous. In Christian terms, we're in need of what St. Paul in his letter to the Romans called 
a renewing of our minds. I'm not sure, but I think the exact quote was, do not be conformed to neoliberal capitalism, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. <laughs> it's in the Bible. You can, you can go look that up. <laughs> One way to renew our minds and therefore cultivate an ecological imagination is through language. We need a robust and visceral language of place that can create in us the possibility for attachment to those places that can make us love and care for them. I'll mention two books that make this point emphatically. One is the book Landmarks by the British writer Robert McFarlane. The book is what McFarlane calls, quote, a word hoard of the astonishing lexus for landscape that exists in the comprision of islands, rivers, strands, fells, lochs, quarries, hedgerows, fields, and edgelands, uneasily known as Britain and Ireland. One, I'll just give you one example of one of the terms that McFarland uncovers, and there are thousands of them, but one of them is Rionach Maoim. And Bishop Ty can correct my Gaelic here, but Rionach Maoim means the shadows cast on the moorland by clouds moving across the sky on a bright and windy day. McFarland's hope is that such a glossary of place-specific words will serve as what he calls, quote, a counter-desecration phrasebook. Lewis Hyde described in his Common as Air book the need for stents, the communal prohibitions on the right to overuse or destroy. You might think of McFarland's book as a collection of linguistic stents for the Anthropocene. If we keep alive the names of specific places, perhaps we would be less likely to destroy them. Landmarks is focused on the British Isles. We have an American version of that here in, in Barry Lopez's book, Home Ground, Language for an American Landscape, which is also a collection of very specific landscape terms. And in his introduction, Lopez says, says this, American poets and novelists have recognized that something emotive abides in the land and that it can be recognized and evoked even if it cannot be thoroughly plumbed. It is inaccessible to the analytic researcher, invisible to the ironist. To hear the unembodied call of a place, that numinous voice, one has to wait for it to speak through the harmony of its features, the suffing of wind across its upward reach against a clear night sky, its fragrance after a rain. One must wait for the moment when the thing ceases to be a thing and becomes something that knows we are there something that knows we are there. Lopez's evocation, Lopez's evocation of the numinous quality of landscape echoes Lewis Hyde's claim that there are psychological, spiritual, and mythic elements to the commons. Which brings me to my second point, the role of the religious imagination. I'm specifically interested in that place where the ecological imagination meets the Christian imagination. I'm a Christian educator. I teach at a divinity school that trains pastors, nonprofit leaders, and chaplains. I teach classes in food justice and climate change and ecology. And in those classes, what I'm mostly trying to do is bring Christianity back down to earth. We've let it float around too long up in the Neoplatonic ether. And it's time to reclaim Christianity for the earthy, visceral, rooted faith that it is. One of the best examples of what happens when you wed the religious imagination to the ecological imagination is Pope Francis Laudato Si. Certainly no public document in my lifetime, and I'm 43, I'm still a spring chicken. <laughs> certainly in my lifetime, no public document has achieved such a marriage. I read Laudato Si not simply as a stirring call to action on climate change or a critique of capitalism or an admonishment to hear the cry of the poor. It is all of those things. But at its heart, I think, Laudato Si is a mystical treatise. Listen to this. Soil, water, mountains, everything is a caress of God, he says. A caress? That's not your typical religious language. It's mystical language. It's the divine lover reaching for his beloved and it's woven like mycelial strands throughout the entire encyclical. 
Pope Francis is out to champion, quote, the mysterious network of relations between things. He sings the praises of fungi, algae, worms, insects, and an innumerable variety of microorganisms. He uses non-mechanistic metaphors describing the Amazon and Congo as, quote, the lungs of the planet, and coral reefs as underground forests. Awe and wonder the results of a mystical union with creation. These are the things that Laudato Si would have us notice. Nature as a whole not only manifests God, but is also a locus of his presence. Pope Francis writes, the spirit of life dwells in every living creature and calls us to enter into relationship with him. Discovering this presence leads us to cultivate the ecological virtues. Riffing on the Sufi mystic Ali al-Kawas, Pope Francis writes, the universe unfolds in God who fills it completely. Hence, there is a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain trail, a dewdrop, a poor person's face. Elsewhere, Pope Francis makes that link Christological. He says, the mystery of Christ is at work in a hidden manner in the natural world as a whole. God is in everything, is the point. Toward the end of the encyclical, Pope Francis enlists the help of St. John of the Cross to underscore his point. The goodness of created things, St. John says, is present in God imminently and infinitely, or more properly, in each of these sublime realities is God. Perhaps worrying a little bit that the Spaniard's words might be read as pantheistic, Pope Francis steps in to qualify. He says, this is not because the finite things of this world are really divine, but because the mystic experiences the intimate connection between God and all beings, and thus feels that all things are God. Standing awestruck before a mountain, he or she cannot separate this experience from God and perceives that the interior awe being lived has to be entrusted to the Lord, end quote. To say that God is in everything does not mean that a hemlock tree is God. It means that God fills and animates that hemlock or reishi growing on it while remaining distinct from it. The ecological crisis is a summons to pro profound interior conversion, writes Pope Francis. Ecological conversion is the phrase he uses elsewhere. That's strong language, even for a pope. A conversion by nature is not simply an intellectual ascent to a new idea, like changing brands of deodorant. Conversion in New Testament parlance implies a complete change of heart, a radical reorientation of one's entire being, ecological conversion. Our current economy presents to us a world shorn of mystery, and I'm ending on this, a world desanctified, and yet our childhood selves know otherwise. We intuit holiness in places like Daniel's Creek and part of the gift Laudato Si gives us is that by wedding the ecological and religious imaginations, it helps us bring back the mystery. The passage into mystery always refreshes, Lewis Hyde wrote in the gift. If, when we work, we can look once a day upon the face of mystery, then our labor satisfies. We are lightened when our gifts rise from pools we cannot fathom then we know that we are not a, soli a solitary egotism and they are inexhaustible. The writer at her desk receiving each day a new gift of words which rise from pools she cannot fathom, a child plucking a reishi mushroom from a dead hemlock and returning a week later to find a new one in its place. These are exercises in receptivity of claiming the world not as raw material for our vaunted human projects but receiving the world as gift. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Fred. It's terrific. Um, your focus on the earth and uh, the, your commitment, the conversion, ecological conversion, uh, great ideas. Uh, Bishop Paul Tai has been with us all day, and if you don't know by now, he was born and schooled in Ireland, <laughs> and he graduated from the University of Dublin in 1979 with a degree in civil law. He studied for the priesthood and was ordained a priest 
of the Dublin Archdiocese in 1983. He taught a bit in moral theology and then was sent to Rome to the Pontifical Gregorian University to study moral theology. He returned and <coughs> taught at Mater Dei Institute of Education in Dublin and at Holy Cross College. In 2004, he was named Director of, the Com of Communications and in 2005, he established the Office for Public Affairs for the Dublin Archdiocese. In November 2007, he was appointed Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. There, he promoted the importance of digital culture for the church and was involved in the launch of some of the Holy See social media initiatives. In June 2014, he was appointed Secretary to the Vatican Media Committee, chaired by former BBC Trust Chairman Lord Christopher Patton charged with developing a plan for restructuring the Holy See's communication resources. That commission successfully integrated several Vatican offices and media into a new secretariat for communications. That work done, in December 2015, he was appointed secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture and elevated to the Episcopate and ordained bishop two weeks after his 58th birthday a year ago in February, in case anyone had any ideas. Before appearing on the panel Compassionate Disruption at last month's South by Southwest Tech Conference in Austin, Bishop Tai told NBC News that social media is shaping how people think. It is how they form their ideas, how they get their education, and if it were, were if it were not present in the digital world, we're going to be absent from their experience. We, we're, we, are, we, t we are told by Christ to go out to the whole world. The compassionate disruption is to say, Bishop Tai added, for the thousands of ambitious techies at the conference attempting to launch startup web platforms, quote, fundamentally, you're a person of value a person of dignity and worth. God loves you and cares for you, whether you pitch well or not. Bishop Ty. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, it's a rather longer version of my biography than I normally acquainted with, but, um, and I'm not sure if there's anything in it that particularly qualifies me to be on the panel here this evening. <laughs> However, um, just on a very light note, um, as I was reading through some of Lewis's materials, I came across the fact that it, for expression I tend to use myself, the law of unintended consequences, is actually coming from a man called Robert K. Merton, who you quote extensively. But one of the unintended consequences of copyright law has been being a little bit parsimonious. I have reacquainted myself with literature that is free online. <laughs> so Trollope has been accompanying me on a lot of my trips recently. <coughs> one of the things that actually comes out there is the way we live now is the great Trollope work is absolutely on things we're looking about today. How do people try to acquire respectability? How do we, do we defend value or do we go with the tide and choose what is kind of more prudentially in our self-interest? And I think there's something just interesting in that. Copyright, I always feel I have to say on behalf of the Irish nation that we'd like to think we invented copyright. Many of you will know the story of the monk, Colum Kill, who copied a book belonging to his master, Finian, in the <coughs> Abbey in Moville up in the north of Ireland. And there was a dispute then as to who owned the copy. <coughs> and the king at the time, Dermot declined, decided in favor of the older monk saying, to every cow it's calf, to every book it's copy. This led to another great war between the monks and the eventual banishment of Colum Kill and the foundation of Iona, another unintended consequence of copyright. <coughs> um, just to link something that I remember when I started looking at the reform of the Vatican media thing, one thing that came up was the copywriting of papal documents, which kind of surprised me because my instinct was it's stuff we want to get out there. We want it out there, get it out as far as we can. And that's still, to some way, my, my instinct. But we discovered, for example, if you want a good French copy, if you want a good translation and availability, and you want people who will then publish other material that won't sell as well as encyclicals, well, then you do a copyright deal 
and it's a way of nourishing and keeping a community alive. It's kind of a, a more noble understanding of copyright. Um, talking about the commons, my, I actually grew up probably with the last of real commons in Ireland. We had bogs where we took turf in the 60s and 70s. And I remember in the rural village where I visited for holidays, a place called Gertrude, which is the, the small field, but there was very little in it. But outside was this wasteland, the bog, which the people who lived in the village had a right to go to and cultivate and cut turf together. And again, the traditions of the people decided who the entitlement, how much you could cut in the sense of preservation, this asset. But more interestingly, again, associated with that was a kind of a, a very rich custom called the mehel. It's an Irish word, which was about a way of working collaboratively. And Mary Robinson is now using that word for a lot of her work on um, environmental justice, about trying to recover this sense of, so the mehel was, we all went out to the bog and we helped you today to do your cutting of the turf, and next week you'll be there to help us with the saving of hay. The other thing was how social life developed around these. One of the great Irish rural traditions was to climb a mountain in the west of Ireland called Croke Patrick, which was climbed on the last Sunday of July every year. And the tradition was it was a good July if you could climb Croke Patrick with the turf saved. So your life was punctuated by traditions, customs, and ways of collaboration and the sense of identity. The other half of the equation was you would climb it with the turf saved and Galway beaten. Galway was the rival county <laughs> against whom you played your football matches, so you're ideal you had them dispatched before you climb. <laughs> On a more serious note, though, thinking about um, Pope Francis and his work on La Dato Si and the dominant image of the common home and trying to recover the sense of the, the world as the common home of all of us with that delightful sense he has of the sensitivity of ecosystems <laughs> but also trying to help us all to realize the world is one very large ecosystem and where we have to be extraordinarily attentive to whether we like it or not. I think Christians, we want to say, make a virtue out of it, but whether we like it or not, we are interdependent. Our choices we make are going to determine the outcomes and the fates of each and every one of us. And I think some sense of a recovery of that in identity, I think it's the thing we need to look at is how we can help people to cultivate that very strong sense of a local identity, of closeness to the earth, and yet at the same time, of belonging to something bigger. There's a very interesting book just out recently. I, I don't like a lot of the conclusions, but the analysis is very interesting by a man called Goodhart looking post-Brexit, and he describes it in terms of the somewheres, the people who belong to something were reacting against the anywheres, the global elite who kind of felt they had the mobility to go anywhere. And those who were more tied to a particular place were recovering a sense of nationalism and sometimes of xenophobia. But how we need to cultivate that sense in digital speech to often called the global. We are local, but we're also global. And how do we recover that? Um, I think, again, um, I think in terms of Pope Francis is trying to help us on that is trying to recover one sense, the sense of if we can involve all people in looking at the problems posed by the environmental issues, then we're going to discover new strengths. And the word that I find it's, it's interesting, and uh, Aaron touched this very well, in Pope Francis there is this very strong distrust of the technocratic paradigm, that somehow the magical thinking that technology is going to resolve us or find a way out of it, and particularly when that technology is going to be produced by commercial interests. He becomes even more suspicious of it. And his invitation to us to really trust more our human capacities and our abilities <coughs> to work together and also to rediscover in that very clearly, he has this thing of traditional wisdoms, which brings me back to the wisdom that determined a lot of our activities in the bog that seemed to be superstitions, but often captivated maybe knowledge that had a value. So, um, Fred, you mentioned the people of the soil. <laughs> and that just got me thinking on the moment about that whole idea of the humus, the earth, and humility. That sense of humility we need to recover. 
in terms of an awareness of the learning that can come from so many quarters and can be a benefit to us. And I think that's the thing, the, the word, and this is something not for today, but I'm hugely concerned about, is Pope Francis, when it comes to solutions, one range of solutions are all headed with the word dialogue. And the sadness of the fact is that at a time when we need the capacity to dialogue, to hear the voices and to learn the wisdom of different people, we're actually becoming a more polarized society. And I think that's where Michael Sandel's idea that we need to recover this idea that we can talk about the big ideas. I mean, we hear so much about post-truth and we're living in a post-truth <coughs> era, and we look for what's causing that, and we can see many causes. But one I think we need to look at is an intellectual tradition that for a while has said we can't talk about the big questions. We have to have this kind of postmodern sophistication that means we don't talk about anything of substance or a claim of Pope Francis of kind of a relativism, which was always the big worry of Pope Benedict and Pope Francis now, the practical relativism, that it's all just about what works for me and what doesn't. But there's no idea of a recovery of a sense of truth or something that is prior to me, something that made claims of me. And just to kind of end up immediately is, Lewis, I love the idea you said there that ultimately copyright laws tell us a lot about how we see ourselves and think about ourselves or imagine ourselves. And are we, to some extent, isolated individuals who must look after their own self-interests and somehow that is magically going to balance itself out and everything's going to be fine? Or are we people who recognize that our best form of living is when we in our choices and in our decisions, think not just about narrow and immediate self-interest, but about the bigger picture and the interests of other people. And I think to just finally conclude the whole thing is, I think that type of thinking, in some ways, do we need to incentivize it? Back to a question that Paul asked earlier. Do we want to incentivize that type of thinking, or do we just live well and think of others because that's going to bring us its own satisfaction and fulfillment. I don't want to go back to an incentive of heaven hell kind of picture that's going to force people into good behavior. But I do think within our Christian perspective, and it's not a perspective that, that Christians have any monopoly on good moral behavior, <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> but that one of the things we have within our story is the story of Christ who gives his life for others and in that, in the resurrection, offers us a narrative that says to us that I think, let's not be romantic. Living well, making choices that are not in one's own interest, thinking of the biggest picture, is not always going to draw immediate applause and great self-congratulations and self-fulfillment. Very often, it's a choice that leads to difficulty, to suffering, to sacrifice. And I think somewhere in the middle of all this, we need to recover what I think Pope Francis is pushing us at is that sense of a discovery of the liberation that comes from living well and the freedom and the guarantee that that's not just, but we have a narrative that says that is the truth and that's the way we should live. So that's, I think, where I'd like to yes, leave it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> In, indeed, all day long, um, uh, the panels and this one in particular have demonstrated the great importance of cross-discipline and the fertilization of ideas that come from bringing people of various backgrounds and interests together and addressing a, a, a topic. I think we got time for one or two questions if there's someone pressing with the question. Yes, David. Could I ask uh, Professor Hyde a question? Um, it occurred to me when you were talking, oh, thank you. It occurred to me when you're discussing the importance of public domain about creating a space where there could be this genuine free uh, sharing of ideas and that this is where we keep ideas from becoming sort of controlled by some people and so forth. How that is today imaged in some circles anyway by talking about the free market of ideas. Uh, and the market image brings the private ownership into play. And uh, these are two very different images. Uh, 
uh, both of which are pointing toward the value of the kind of exchange that takes place. And I'm wondering if you, if you think that there's a, uh, a danger in this language of a free market of ideas that is avoided by this notion of the public domain that you were speaking of, or whether you, I'm just interested in how that, how you'd contrast those and so forth, or whether I'm misreading or mishearing what you're suggesting by bringing those two things, juxtaposing them in that way. Um, well, is this on? Am I speaking? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, just one quick thing I associate to. When I said that commons in traditional European communities were stinted, that there were lots of rules that governed what you couldn't do, the market was also stinted. Uh, that is, in those days, the market would own places where people got together to buy and sell, be one day a week, and during that day, there would be restraint on only in the morning can local people buy and sell, in the afternoon, um, you know, hagglers and higglers were kept out until four in the afternoon. So we don't have that idea anymore of, of, of a constrained market as well as, um, as for the marketplace of ideas, um, I mean, it's a cliche, so I suppose what has to fill out, because there are lots of kinds of marketplaces, and uh, there's a puzzle about who, who controls the market. Um, so I would prefer, I, I mean, I don't mind that phrase, but I would prefer to find some other phrase. <laughs> yeah, to, um, I mean, I was just, in my notes, I was thinking about the story told this morning about, or earlier today, about the town in Texas which votes uh, against fracking. And, um, and then the state, the state legislature comes in and overrides it. Well, those are market forces at work. Somebody, somebody has money at stake. And this is not a marketplace of ideas in the sense that, um, that the commons, you know, in both science and, and, and academic discourse, the idea is that there is something above us that we're trying to get to, that, there's, that the conversation has to do with figuring things out and getting to the truth or getting to consensus. Um, so, I mean, there is an old image of the market as, as, as a sweet way that people get together. And uh, so sometimes that happens. But <laughs> in general, I would I prefer the language of, of uh, common discourse. Father Gale, I'll give you the last question. There. Thank you very much. I had also a question for Professor Hyde. <clears throat> Um, namely, at a certain point of your very inspiring conference, I thought you would mention something of, about the idea that <coughs> commons force us to disentangle a number of properties that are linked usually to private ownership. You know, private ownership that has been conceived in Roman law and then rewritten by some Christian theologians after the uh, Gregorian reform is, made, is based on three pillars, usus, fructus and abusus in Latin. And in a sense, commons force us to emphasize usus and to de-emphasize fructus and abusus. Can you translate for us? Yeah, usus it means that I use something. Okay, I have the right, the right to use it. Yeah. Abusus means I have the right to destroy it if I want. Yeah. And fructus, I have the right to sell it and to get some fruit of it. Yeah. Okay? So in a sense, commons would force us to emphasize usus we are the stewards of what we have. We are not the owners of it. And this relates to an old debate in the 15th century uh, raised by Franciscan theologians to uh, pontifical theologians, because at this time, the Franciscans uh, said, we are not the owners of our convents. God is the owner. That means his representative, who is the pope, is the owner. And then, um, since at this time, the pontifical theologians were very clever, they understood that this would be a massive arm of this destruction of the idea, the very idea of private ownership. So they said, no, 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 no. The Pope is not the owner of your convents, but do you are the owners? So and so, this debate uh, initiated, I think, uh, the idea that we could disentangle the three pillars: usus, fructus, abusus. And now it seems to me we have <clears throat> a number of people who say that commons, creative commons, you know, uh, copyleft, and all these. New, new ways to understand ownership, 
leads to the idea that <clears throat> ownership is a bundle of rights and that we have to disentangle them and then we can play with the different rights associated to ownership. What do you think about all this? Well, yes, I mean, this is a classic definition of, of property, that it, it is a bundle of rights. Um, I mean, I, in the book I talk about, there's an old dictionary definition of property as a right of action, and then there are th many, many actions you can take in regard to any particular thing. So yes, you could sell it, you could destroy it, you could use it without destroying it, you could rent it, you could, um, and what's important then, well, in traditional commons, are, are uh, understood in terms of the bundle of rights that go with them, and they aren't always the same. Uh, like, um, you know, when you talk about collecting mushrooms, apparently in a forest in the United States, you have extraction rights, or no, nobody cares that you extract these mushrooms. Uh, but you could make a list of, of, of what the rights are or what the actions are that you take. Um, I mean, what was of interest to me was I like the, the idea of, of uh, property as a right of action because it begins with agency, that there are things I'm going to do, as opposed to the Blackstone uh, idea which begins with exclusion. And in a sense, exclusion is, an, is a right, is, is an action, I'm going to exclude you, but it's a particular category of action which uh, extinguishes the actions of other people. So, yeah, I, I entirely, I mean, I find it very useful to talk about property is in terms of a bundle of rights and, uh, and then to take it apart and to look at commons in that way um, and that private property is, a, is, a, you know, is a very small strain of the great universe of, of, of possible rights. So, yes. Good. Thank you very much. Well, um, Louis and uh, Fred and Paul, thank you very much for this uh, concluding panel for our day. And just as a final wrap up, um, our partner in this idea and bringing it forth as a conference has been from the beginning, the Pontifical Council for Culture. And so I ask uh, Bishop Tai if he has any concluding remarks. Just to say um, how happy I am. And you know, there's sometimes the dormant partner and we have had a fairly, we've, I'd really want to acknowledge that a lot of the work that really made this possible today came from Paul and from John, and to thank them so much for their encouragement and their involvement in this. I also bring best greetings from Cardinal Ravazzi, who appreciates very much this um, link to Georgetown. Our council has not been terribly active over the years in the US, and Georgetown have given us that kind of breach head that allows us into a type of conversation that I think is very, very worthwhile. Um, one of the things that struck me is, and I, probably will just quote it because I think the richness of our discussion today vindicated, I think, something that it is important about the nature of dialogue. And I recently get, was giving a talk and somebody said afterwards, you're extremely positive on Pope Francis. And I said, why was that? And they said, because you kept calling him Saint Francis. So um, <laughs> I will be sure now that I'm going to quote Pope Francis. Um, and something subliminal was happening there, but I, we, we've noticed this theme, but it's, I think it's a very strong statement coming from Pope Francis. And I've meant your references already, but I'll just, his own statement of it. It can be said that many problems of today's world stem from the tendency, at times unconscious, to make the method and aims of science and technology an epistemological paradigm which shapes the lives of individuals and the workings of society. The effects of imposing this model on reality as a whole, human and social, are seen in the deterioration of the environment, but this is just one sign of a reductionism which affects every aspect of human and social life. He goes on to say that the risk is being dominated by the internal logic of certain ways of thinking. His answer to that is an invitation for all of us to work together that we would have a distinctive way of looking at things, a way of thinking, policies, an education program, a lifestyle and a spirituality which together generate resistance to the assault of the technocratic paradigm. I think we've nearly referenced this, all those things. The richness of the contributions from so many people kept alive that kind of richer human approach. Somebody was saying, how do we incentivize the humanities? I think maybe a discussion like today is not because 
humanities are in rival, but I think these are conversations we also need to broaden out and invite people coming more from the technological and scientific worlds to partner with us in these type of discussions. And as I say, I think this has been just a wonderful discussion. It's my first exposure to this method of learning together. And I'd just as I say, like to acknowledge particular um, the contribution of Georgetown President De Joya and all of you here this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.